The information in this podcast is current on the day of recording. It is general advice only and does not take your personal situation into account. It may not be suitable for you. Participants in this podcast may also own the stocks discussed. For a full list of current recommendations and stocks owned by staff, members of Intelligent Investor can visit www.intelligentinvestor.com.au. Welcome to Stock Take. My name's Gaurav Sodi. Joining me today is Research Director Nathan Bell. Hey, Nathan. Hi, Gaurav. Well, with us also is James Carlisle. Hey, James. Good day. <laughs> James, what are we in now? Week seven, week eight of isolation. We've all got kids at home. Has anyone gone mad? I bet, oh, who's, who's had it worst? I reckon I'm going to put my hand up for the worst experience since I've got the youngest children. But Nathan, oh, it's, you got my, three. Mine are great. Mine are great. I mean, mine are t- sort of, well, teenager and almost teenager. And, uh, you know, they load the washing machine and uh, the dishwasher. I mean, and they're, you know, they're no trouble at all at this age. No, actually, they're now back at school. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. No wonder it's so easy. It gets easier. Yeah. <laughs> Nathan, what about you? You got three. That's That's pretty tough. Well, I think you saw yesterday that they were taunting me and making fun of me on a Zoom meeting while I wasn't looking, <laughs> hanging little toys over my shoulder and spooking me. Yeah, you look like you're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's the 18-year-old. Yeah. It's the hardest, I tell you. The nine-year-olds are easy. Uh, my five-year-old oh, really? is just a pleasure. He's so wonderful. But my two-and-a-half-year-old is just uh, a little terror. He's awful, awful. It's I'm telling you, enjoy the early years, boys. <laughs> Sure, he loves you too, Gora. <laughs> <laughs> it's the it's the worst of the, I think the worst of all humanity is wrapped up in a two year old. Every awful quality in a person you find in a two year old child, <laughs> <laughs> and and all the cute bits. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're still alive because of the cute bits. Otherwise, oh geez, you you wouldn't want them, would you? Well, yeah, wait till you get a grumpy there. eighteen year old. Yeah, and there's no good. cute bits. Well, who's, who's been locked up for eight weeks? I think the children are doing it hard under all this. Yeah, the teenager, you're right. I mean, uh, they're, no, they're no trouble, but but it's not good to lock a teenager up. Unless they need to be locked up, eh? Yeah. JC, let's begin with Macquarie Group. This is a business we've got a pretty long history with, actually. We've, we've recommended this on and off for a long time, for years. I think in aggregate, we've got a very strong record and we've had multiple analysts. So I'd like to think this is a business we understand quite well. But the flip side... In a, in a relative kind of a sense, yeah. <laughs> I was just about to say, is it a business you can ever really understand really well? Because it just changes so much. So as a real, as an analyst who's picking this, this company up again, what are the key, the most important things when covering Macquarie? What's, what's the essence of this business? Well, I think what we've done well with it over the years is, um, is to separate what's actually sort of going on inside of it the the black boss box aspects if you like um with the sort of culture in the business and uh you know um the way that it, it it's able just to sort of shift to new markets quickly it employs a lot of bright people um and it sets them to work it give it it gives them license to go and find ways to make money essentially mm. um and they do that and over the years they've reinvented themselves a number of times and they seem to keep doing that and so I think really the the thing is to try to back that um, and not to get carried away uh, on either side um, with with what's going on within the business. So, you know, we've written about in our articles about the sort of lumpy items and, you know, when everything's going well, the profits are flattered by by a lot of these things. Um, and everything when everything goes wrong, um, the, the, it happens in reverse. And so I think you do get very good opportunities to buy it. And I think, you know, the, the idea is to be, you know, in the past we possibly bought it a bit too soon on the downside and, um, you know, it gets it can get very cheap. So I think, you know, we, we missed a, possibly missed an opportunity recently, but I think it was right, you know, to it's right to be greedy with the stock. Yeah, I can't think of too many other stocks that oscillate so violently between universal love and, uh, disdain. Um, we've seen both over multiple cycles. Where do you think we are now? Is this um, an interesting looking price for you? Or do you think it still embeds too much optimism? Oh, I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a whole, it's a whole price, which is, which is our recommendation. I think, you know, at the moment, uh, yeah, people have looked at the latest result and it, it all looked okay. Um, uh, you know they're obviously taking more impairments. There's going to be um, fewer inv- uh, less less investment income this year. 
Um, so people are taking that on board, but, but, you know, the thing is not in any danger, you know, there's no solvency risk. The balance sheet is strong. Um, and so people are still, yeah, I think they're still quite liking it and the market's quite liking it. So, um, you know, that's not to say we, you know, we're playing the sentiment in any sense, but, but I think, you know, it, it can get quite bad. And at the moment people aren't sort of factoring that into the, uh, to the price, I don't think. Nath, as our sometime banking analyst, you've been a little bit wary of the big four. How do you think Macquarie rates in that category? Yeah, the, uh, where I'll start here. I think in the old days, we used to, it used to be called Macquarie Bank. And I think what really changed, well, what really did change in 2009, which was when I first started covering it, was out of the aftermath of the GFC, it became a fund manager. So I don't even think you can, in my view, you can't even compare Macquarie with the four banks anymore. Um, the only thing they really have in common is that Macquarie does own a bank, and it's uh, you know it's quite a big business, about forty billion dollar business now at current market cap. Um, but it, what it's trying to do from here on is actually quite the opposite to the four banks. The four banks are looking like they're going to get out of funds management, and Macquarie continues to bulk up. And I think that strategy makes sense. Um, JC James might argue differently, but. Um, no, no, my, I agree entirely. Yeah. yeah. So my view is that if you just look around what's been successful for businesses of this size in the financial uh, industry, if you look to the US and to Canada where you see the Brookfields and the Blackstones and all these sort of guys, they basically, they're fund managers. You know, they might have different aspects to the way they manage the funds, whether it's private equity or just regular funds. or And that's really what Macquarie did exceptionally well coming out of the GFC at uh, you might remember all the satellite businesses that it had that were separately listed. Uh, essentially, they essentially chopped those off and they got bought up or merged into other entities and started buying funds management businesses. And it did particularly well in the US, which is obviously a, a massive market compared to Australia. But if you think about what was really interesting about Macquarie in 2009, at one stage there, it was trading at a big discount to net tangible assets. So that's how frightening um, the GFC was compared to this pandemic, you know, personally, I was much more frightened during the GFC yeah. when banks started rolling over. I and remember that. I remember Brian Johnson, um, you know, the, the the famed banking analyst. I don't know where he was working at the time, but he's uh, been a long bull on Macquarie. He remember, he remember him saying that Macquarie's office building was worth more than the entire market cap at some <laughs> point in the GFC. And I still <laughs> didn't buy the stock. <laughs> yeah, That tells you how low prices were. Um, yeah. So you got a big discount to NTA to start with. So you had this great protection on the downside, uh, but it did really well changing the strategy of the business. It bought fund management businesses quickly, so it scaled up really fast overseas. And then it just rode the bull market, you know, the longest bull market in history for the next 11 years, earning performance fees as it goes. And it worked an absolute treat. But back when I was recommending it, say $20 when it was at a discount to NTA, um, you know, that's what one fifth of today's price. So that's about an $8, an $8 billion business that's about to go overseas and really expand. So you could see that a business of that size could grow very quickly, but now it's a much more mature business. So I don't think the next 10 years, at least in terms of the growth, is going to look anything like the past 10 years. I think the right comparison is with Brookfield. I often think about um, Macquarie, not in terms of a traditional merchant bank or certainly not a retail bank, but but more of that sort of Brookfield mold, which I think culturally as well, those two businesses align pretty closely. Brookfield is an amazing business. I've long admired it. And it has a knack of just getting in its fingers into all sorts of weird areas and making money from them. Um, and key seems to be just giving smart people the license to go out and be entrepreneurial, very much in the Macquarie mold as well. It's a shame we can't um, we can't get access to Brookfield. I think that's one of the, the great businesses that many people have never heard of. <laughs> I'm not going Jacob. to try and pronounce the uh, current CEO's name. I do a terrible <laughs> job of it, but um, uh, Rumanayaka. Okay, that's uh, much better than I was going to do. And <laughs> and she came out of the funds management business at Macquarie, so I think um, you know maybe it's just coincidence, but I, I think that's where the future will be for the business because I just don't know how else you can scale a forty billion dollar business and grow mm -hmm. quite quickly without being in funds management. JC, one thing I did want to um, ask with you, one thing I've been worried about with Macquarie is its exposure to aircraft leasing. It's one of the world's, or I thought it was one of the world's largest um, uh, asset owners of aircrafts, and they have this leasing business. That surely has to be in a bit of trouble at the moment. Um, is that a problem, or is that just a small part of Macquarie and doesn't make a difference? 
Well, um, gosh, <laughs> there are lots of parts of Macquarie. <laughs> it's, I mean, I think it's a relatively small part. And look, I, I, I um, take the uh, provisions they've made at face value. I mean, they've gone through the book, they've looked at all that, mm. um, and they've come up with the impairments for this year. They're usually quite um, conservative with impairments, aren't they? Yeah, I think so. And you know, look, it's it's. I, I don't think that they have any incentive to sort of uh, uh, shy away from that either. With a new new, new executive, CEO. yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And also, you know, it's hardly the, the current environment. They can hardly be blamed for any impairments this year. So, um, you know, I think it's it's reasonable to you know, to, I, it's hard to second guess what they're doing with that. I think. Mm. Okay, JC. So crunch time. What price? What would you need to see to get you over the line on Macquarie? Well, this is what I said in the article, and this we haven't put a price guide on it because you know I think all things being equal, we'd probably buy it below about eighty dollars um, as you know as things stand at the moment. But the problem is, if we get to eighty dollars, it'll be because the the global situation's deteriorated again, um, and probably we'd then want to buy it a bit cheaper, which is why it, it, it you, you tie yourself. Um, up in knots if you if you put a price guide i think on macquarie when when things are changing so rapidly as they are at the moment um you've got to be able to uh you've got to be able to change your um your view of, of, the, of the value and the price guide so what would have to happen well it, i think for us to want to buy it i, I suspect it, the deterior the situation will have to get a lot worse um and uh the market would have to start baking too much, uh, even more than that, into it. So, mm. you know, where where that means for the share price, I, d- I don't know. Um, but uh, it, it'd have to be lower than eighty dollars, I think, um, and, and probably a bit lower than that. I mean, you know, uh, depending on on the situation. Yeah, I know what you mean. There are, I think, especially as you get more experience as an investor, sometimes there's a you get kind of this feel for uh, when the right time is to buy a, a stock that you've been going for a long time. You can, and I think Macquarie is 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 really well, think, well suited to that. Yeah, I think when 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 its office building is worth more than the current market cap. That's, that's not a that's wow. <laughs> no, I mean uh, you know I think that there are sometimes you can look at valuations and and just you know to put a cold you know wet towel over your head and say look this just is not right. Surely you know I mean. I suppose I suppose to get to the, those situations, you've got to have solvency issues, and you know people are wondering whether it can go to zero and things like that. But mm. um, yeah, I, I, I think it's 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 not it's not so much a feeling in your gut as as sometimes you can feel as though the market is yes. is uh, getting very short term in its mm. in its outlook. Yeah. And at the moment, I think uh, they're not quite doing that with Macquarie. Mm. Well, you know. Um, they're not doing it with a stock I was looking at either, uh, Megaport, which has got to be one of the most complex and extraordinary businesses I've seen um, in some time, actually. Um, extraordinary, not really in terms of quality, because I was not blown away by the quality of this business. I, I was just amazed at the story weaving through the company all the way, and other investors seem to just love it. It's a, it's a genuinely hot stock. It's a $2.5 billion business that does, what, $50 million in revenue or something like that. And uh, it, it's losing more money every year. Um, so it, on the surface, it looks absolutely bonkers. I often like those I- IDs that don't screen well, that look crazy from the outside. I think if you pull them apart, sometimes there's hidden bits of value or ways you can see value growing. Not the case here at all. This is actually crazy fantasy fantasy style um, valuation going on here. Let's try and um, explain what uh, what Megaport does. And I think I spent weeks trying to understand what this company actually does. And it's not easy at all. So um, for businesses who don't have access, who don't have physical equipment inside data centers, or don't have um, big racks uh, for themselves, so, so mostly cloud businesses, I, I suppose, or, or smaller businesses, but they want to access... Um, the connections available in data centers or cloud capacity that's bought through data centers, they can actually access all those services and assets with um, a megaport connection. And the connection comes from um, like a router, a physical piece of kit that's then um, has a software on top of that. And once you, once you have data centers um, and other businesses 
and more data centers um, that have, a have access to these ports, it creates a sort of a network and then you can access any other um, link in that network that also has one of those ports. They call it a mega port, hence the name of the business. Um, and so that's what the business is. It's actually a, a way of, it's an onboarding um, platform, I guess. It's not, I don't really like to use a platform. It's not a platform. It's an onboarding service um, to get access to cloud services and to get access to other services provided by data centers. Um, the, the way you describe it, kind of, uh, it, you see, the thing that it strikes me about this is it's, it sounds almost like you're describing the internet. Yes, and, uh, yeah. And so, you know, make, trying to create a competitor to, to the internet has been a, a road to ruin <laughs> for the last 20, right. 30 years. And I wonder why why this would be any different. Is, is there any, am I missing something there? Is it, do they provide better security? Is that why people want to use them rather than using the internet? Yeah, so, so you're right. So what they're doing is, is providing a parallel internet because not only are they providing the um, connection hubs, but then they also go off and lease um, fiber. It's unlit fiber called dark fiber, which is fiber that's in the ground but hasn't actually been utilized yet. So it's like vacant fiber. Um, and they lease um, that fiber so they can create parallel, like a private closed um, internet loop. Um, and the reason for doing that is um, speed, reliability, and security. There's no doubt that um, dark fiber offers all of that. And there's a huge, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of um, dark fiber being sold all the time. TPG is a huge owner of dark fiber assets. Telstra is Australia's largest owner of dark fiber. And there's a lot of it being sold. It's extremely useful. Pretty much every corporate in in the world uses some bit of dark fiber. So it's it is a valuable piece of infrastructure. But so why would you go to Megaport rather than Telstra, um, uh, or did Telstra just not do this? I well, mean, is it the software, the the connections, and the ports? And the well, if, if you're centers? sitting if you're sitting here in Sydney and you don't have access to a data center, say in Hong Kong, but there's someone in Hong Kong. You have a client in Hong Kong you want to make a, um, a server level connection with, and they have a mega port. You can order order a mega port and then make that server connection, and it will be routed through a dark fiber network and and travel through mega port zone software. And you'll have that have a um, have a software based um, network connection, and that will be secure. It will be fast. It will be easy. And the way you pay for it is pay paying a monthly fee to access the hardware, and you just pay for the the data that you download. Um, so, and the router you put in your own office or in your own home. Yes, you don't. Right. That, that's in, not in a data center. Yeah, correct. Yeah. It's in so, your own office. Yeah. So, there, yeah. there's it's actually solving a legitimate problem. It's a real. It's a really nifty solution to a genuine problem that lots of businesses face. The problem with it is it's spending an awful lot of money to construct a dense network. And there are so many com com competitive or substitute ways to achieve, to solve that same problem. And um, you know, just one example I just gave in the article was that what, was that if you have um, large data center operators and that industry is consolidating rapidly and you've got a couple of very large data centers now around the world that have um, hundreds of locations, um, you can actually do the same thing. You can link your data centers together through a software defined network and um, it's actually easier just to do that rather than, um, you know, everyone having a mega port. Um, you, everyone can create their own little networks. And the reason why that is a danger is because in the cloud space, the, the size of your network doesn't really grant it value, right? The, what you need to create value in, in the cloud, in cloud space is just access to a handful of hyperconnectors. There's probably a dozen, half a dozen even. Um, big um, people you need to connect with. They're called hyperconnectors. There's people like AWS, um, uh, uh, Google, Microsoft, um, and, you know, rattle them off. Or you have all the other names, the, the big tech companies. If you can connect with those, then that's pretty much, that creates most of the value of the network. You know, the, the, it's unusual because the, usually the size of the network is related to the value that it confers. The cloud is is quite unusual because the density of the network does not necessarily create more value. And that's why you can so, replicate these things quite easily and why there are so many other ways of replicating what, what Megaport has done. So is what you're saying that the, the so going back to your analogy of the um, your business partner in, in Hong Kong, mm. rather than making a 
direct link with that person in Hong Kong, you'd be better off if both of you just linked to AWS at, in, in some data center. Is that is that the is that the difference? You could you could link to AWS through through AWS's platform. But for that to happen, they 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 they've got to be in a data center, and we've got to be in a data center here. Correct. And you've got to be connecting. So so yeah. so it's it's a megaports allowing you to to make a connection without going through. Uh, that's right. So, so to make that connection, you need physical infrastructure. But most businesses would have some sort of physical infrastructure or rack um, somewhere. Uh, it's it's an unusual business that, well, not an unusual. I guess it's a lot of businesses, but it's by no means the majority of businesses that that um, are limited to Megaport as the only solution. Most of Megaport's customers will have rack somewhere, and um, and they'll have a choice of whether to use, say, the Next DC network or the Equinix network. Or um, you know, there's a couple of Asian competitors that are doing exactly the same thing. They can use their networks, or they can use the Megaport network. And just because Megaports is the the largest, densest network, it does not make it better than anyone else's. Because most, you know, 80% of customers and Meg Megaports own numbers support this. You can see where the data is coming and going from. Two thirds of their connections are made just with um, with cloud. You know, a handful of of cloud companies. Um, and that's true across the industry as well, that most connections are actually going through a very limited number of places. So if you replicate those small number of places, you can actually challenge the network quite easily. Uh, and, and that's why I just think this valuation is, is absolutely mad. Um, it's, it's, I, I, don't, I can't see it uh, really being worth this much. And even at half the levels, I, I think you're still struggling to make a speculative case um, uh, for this company. So it was, it was an interesting business to look at because I think it teaches um that's a lot about the cloud business and and the sort of direction it's going but in terms of uh in in investment options this is certainly not one gents do you if you guys come across do you guys come across businesses like this where there's a dominant narrative and um the the price of the stock actually reflects the narrative and not the business at all? Is that something you see very often? Because I have to say, in my stocks, I, I just see it all the time, um, whether it's telcos, tech, or resources. Um, I, I see narrative dominate the share price and valuation almost more than numbers often do. I think we, we, you put me on the spot. I can't, think of, <laughs> I can't think of it. But I do see it all the time. And I think you said it best in your article, um, which is that investing is about, you know, separating the reality from the narrative. Everything is about a narrative because that's what the media gets involved with. That's what that's what brokers get involved with. Everyone's telling a story because that's what people understand. People people recognize a story. So that's how um articles are written. That's how broker notes are written. That's and and so, you know, these stories sometimes develop their own uh, you know, momentum um on the upside and on the downside. Yes. And um, and that can that that that's I suppose what creates a lot of the short termism, and that's what you can take advantage if you can take advantage of if you can step back um, and and see that the reality is is you know better than that um, or uh, you know so. I think one of the some of the most dominant stories I think that is, that are still we still hear about today is the rise of the um, Chinese middle class. Uh, that's a story that. So many businesses I see in their presentations, the Chinese middle class is going to be 300 million people. If we can just capture, you know, 2% market share, that means we can have access to, you know, 6 million, whatever it is, you know. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it's a really seductive little theme and so many businesses latch onto it. Um, well, and, I think management, I mean, you know, management are telling us stories as well, yeah. uh, you know, in a sense, in, in their presentations, every, they're all trying to create that narrative and and tell that story to people um and that's that's the, the you know the way that people try to understand it and so you know the, the that's exactly how these things develop their own momentum and I, and I don't think it's just about specific things like you know baby boomers and the chinese and and you know even the internet and things like that and mm. the cloud and and all that um there's just subtle ways you know that the, the management and, and and the media is telling a story about you know a, a business being a you know it's you know a lot of businesses are labeled you know so-called you know quality businesses and then when something changes people can be very slow yeah, to yeah. to recognize that actually the world's a slightly different place than it was um arb might be a, an example of that um 
And invocate maybe another one on the other side. Yeah, that's right. So these mm. massively high quality businesses, then everyone's latched onto the idea that they're just very high quality. And so people then just a bit slow to, to spot when that changes. I love how with every cycle, there's new acronyms. And <laughs> one of the big ones for the last 10 years has been yeah. TAM, Total Addressable Market. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, now we're seeing, uh, is it EBITDA C? Um, earnings without uh, coronavirus <laughs> losses. Um, like I said, you know, you talk about stories. Like you know, this is how stories take on. Um, you know, all the momentum that they do is because people do do exactly what you said about the Chinese story. You just need a little bit of market share in a giant market, and all of a sudden you can pay that astronomic value for a stock mm. that doesn't make any money. Yeah, in the last in the last cycle, it was bricks. Do you remember that? Everyone was talking about the brick economies. That was the everyone had this their own their little acronym for for the markets they were most excited about. Um, if you guys ever read the book um, *Sapiens*, because I think that deals with this phenomenon really well. That's that's um, got me thinking a lot about the use of narrative in history and in culture. Um, it, it, in that book, he the author um, Harari Adam is an Israeli historian and. He just um, he talks about all of human history through the lens of um, narrative and story, and how people in, uh, come up with stories um, to serve all sorts of different functions. And um, he looks at the very start of human history throughout, you know, the, to, to modern history, and and um, and runs through how they're actually all just a whole series of different narratives and stories that we tell ourselves and everyone believes. It's quite an interesting read, actually. I, I recommend it if you haven't had a look at it before. Yeah, no, it's a great book. Nath, um, speaking of stories, you've got a cracking one for us. There's a tale of a... Is that, is that cracking or crappy? <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, don't spoil the ending. Here's a this tale of a, uh, a boring, um, often thought to be high-quality business that then um, acquires this really exciting tech platform. What happens next? <laughs> Uh, so we're talking about Link Administration or Link Financial Services. And... Oh, sounds exciting already. <laughs> <laughs> and the easiest way to describe the business is uh, it's it's a lot like computer share. It's uh, just a financial administration business. And they've been, uh, in the past, very good businesses. I mean, computer share's growth slowed down now, but it was a tremendous business. There's been overseas growth for, for Link and for computer share in the past. And it's actually worked quite well because... There was also a trend for companies to be outsourcing uh, a lot of their financial administration, and that was a, a big tailwind. And Link um, has made, I think, when it refloated out of private equity three or four years ago, it actually, you know, was essentially bragging, saying, "Look, we've made forty acquisitions over the past however long, and that's going to be great because we've got this now multi-billion-dollar business." And you've got to give credit to to anyone that does create a business of that size, but it also comes with risks. And the bigger the business get, the bigger the bets have to be, the more debts used and it's a familiar story that eventually one of the acquisitions doesn't work out and you end up in a turnaround situation, which is where we find Link. Is Link actually, is, is it a turnaround or is it a, um, I is think it a it business is in decline? Yeah, well, that, that's a very good question because um, I, I would consider it in a turnaround because this was, uh, I'm not sure what the peak price was, but I think it was definitely in the eights. Mm, and yeah. it's now at $3.35. Uh, so it's fallen a long, long way. I would never say, you know, maybe it got to a little bit of darling status towards the top, but uh, I don't think this was a business that you read much about. But it ticked a few boxes. The balance sheet was pretty healthy. Um, there was growth. Uh, um, the one thing I was always wary of, and it's I guess it's come back to bite us, was when you're in a 10 or 11 year bull market and you see something that looks like decent quality, but it's the valuation looks very mm. cheap compared to everything else. Mm. And obviously the market thinks there's something wrong with it. And uh, in retrospect, it seems that they didn't trust in the acquisitions that were being made. And that turns out that uh, some of the ones made last year in, in the UK in particular haven't worked out. And now you've got uh, just lower financial activity. So the, the numbers coming out of this business over the next uh Four months, I expect, will be awful, and never underestimate this management's ability to disappoint you. Is, is what I'd say about the upcoming numbers. No matter how low you set your expectations, they always seem to do worse. And what really bugs me is when you see management not just um, you know addressing those concerns straight up. Uh, this management team uh, at Link prefers to 
say, you know, mention that there's things going wrong, but they tend to be in small letters further down the page and they just try to get you looking at whatever happens to be going right in the business at some time. And mm-hmm. when you've made 45 acquisitions over history, something's going to be working out. Tell us about um, PEXA, what that business is and, and why it's maybe the most interesting part of Link. So one of its purchases, uh, I'm not sure when the original uh, purchase was made, but it's in a business called PEXA, which is essentially property settlement. Uh, it's the it's, it's the online version, really. So a lot of this stuff, not that I've ever had the privilege, but uh, was was done just you know using paper, and the paper had to go around to a lot of people, and there's you know conveyance and all sorts of things, and everyone had to sign their documents and send them around. It's just a very slow um, process, mm. you know, particularly in the year 2020. So this business PEXA was set up and. Uh, PEXA does it, a lot of it online, so it speeds up the process. It's you know, Theoretically, it should be more accurate and, and faster and a, a better record uh, keeping that's um, you know, less risk of going up in a fire or something like that. So for all those reasons, PEXA makes sense. And it's also a monopoly in several states. Um, I think New South Wales, Victoria and Western Australia, or maybe it's Queensland. Um, so it's really it's a really really valuable business as well because you've, there's always going to be properties transacted. There's always going to be services around those transactions that need to be done, and Link owns 44.2 percent of that business, and it was recently increasing its stake. I think it was early last year, uh, maybe late the year before, when it um, increased its stake while a couple of other uh, owners of the business sold out. So this is a really valuable business and it looks like uh, well they are dressing it up now they're just resetting the capital structure for it so mm. um, media suggesting it'll be IPO next year I think that seems to be a fair call I don't think it'll take too long so maybe 12 months out and assuming the markets um, you know I'll get I would assume in 12 months time you get a very good price for this business and um, you might have read in the paper that there's a few people arguing about the fact that it, it is a monopoly and there needs to be some way to curtail monopoly powers but um, that's to no avail so far and the suggestions that it could go for two billion dollars or more which on an estimate of 200 million dollars in revenue next year would be 10 times revenue uh, which sounds monstrous but in a uh, if you look at things like realestate.com.au which are similar type businesses Mm. uh, they they regularly trade at 10 times revenue and um, and transactions are done often at even higher prices so, so when I look, I looked at this um, a couple of years ago, um, only a fairly cursory, cursory glance, I should say. But um, w- w- what I struggled with was that the total market size for um, for doing the property settlements. You know, it's actually a very small market when mm. it comes to it, and uh, and so that puts a natural sort of cap on the valuation. Even if they get the whole of that, and they're not far away from that, you know, it's there's, well, it's about the shift to to digital, isn't it? But but once they get that, um, and I think that I I read recently they're now talking about using that as a platform for other services. Is a do you know what what other services those might be? Uh, I haven't actually haven't read about them for a little while, but uh, I'm not the expert on property anyway. But I just assume anyone that does a service. Um, can have um, you know feedback on the platform as to whether they did well or not, and then can sell their wares right across the platform to um, agents or whoever else. So you can see how it's. They, I guess they're trying to make it a bit of a one-stop shop for anything to do with property transactions. But I assume that's going to be fairly small beer uh, compared to the actual property settlements, uh, which is where the main money is made. Uh, yeah, I think you're quite right. It is it's, it is a limited market. Um, but the one thing it's got going for it is growing rapidly currently. I think it only did fourteen million dollars in revenue three years ago, and now it's looking at doing two hundred next year. Uh, but what will happen over the next five years is, even if the revenue starts to slow, the profits will increase dramatically. Um, now, whether that justifies a valuation of two billion, or some people are even suggesting it'll go for more than two billion, um, I guess you have to make up your own mind. What's the what's the logic of actually separating it? Because they only bought this thing a few what two years ago, if if that, and they paid a really big price for it uh, at the time as well. Um, are they now selling it because um, to highlight value in Link itself, or is there other incentive to do that? Well, the thing is, we don't know what's going to happen. Who's going to be selling any shares in the IPO? 
So it's not like Link have said, you know, we own 44.2% now and we want to get down to 20%, so we're going to sell those shares through the IPO. Um, people with, familiar with IPOs might have heard, uh, I think it's called the Chairman's Round. Uh, this is usually when IPOs happen and the insiders get all their mates on board mm. for the float to get shares. So I don't know what the, the Chairman's Round will look like for this business. I don't know whether some of the other... Um, investors in the business, which I think still include Commonwealth Bank, whether they'll sell out in the process. I, I, the business doesn't need capital. Like this is a business that, yep. um, you know, like an REA group or Seek, I mean, Seek's probably a bit different, does got a few more things to do these days. But um, those internet businesses, they don't need a lot of reinvestment. So it's not like Pex is going out there to raise capital for growth. Uh, it, it's got all the capital that's needed. So any shares that are going to be available to the market will be from investors selling out. Now, I don't know what Link um, is going to do uh, in terms of its ownership, whether it'll sell some and keep the rest, or um, I mean, I'm sure it'll se- certainly keep some, um, but whether that, you know, that probably go into an escrow and whether they'll be looking to sell out over the next one or two years, I have no idea. But Link's debt is a bit higher than what it ought to be. They've got some leniency from their bankers at the moment. And I wouldn't be surprised if they sell out at least some of that PEXA shareholding uh, to reduce their debt. Um, there's a few things they could do with the money. They, they could, if their shares are still uh, where they are today, they could buy back shares, which I think would be add some value, um, you know, reduce the debt as well. They could make acquisitions, which uh, although they've got a mixed record in the past, if, if valuations were still cheap, uh, and then maybe this is a good time to do them. But there's, if you look at the valuation of Lincoln, I think this is probably the most important part for anyone that owns it or is thinking about buying it is the current value market value is around $2 billion. Uh, let's say PEXA goes for $2 billion, and that would mean so roughly, let's just keep round numbers here, let's say it's a $1 billion for uh, value for Link, uh, which leaves you with a, the rest of the, the rump of the business, the more just traditional financial administration businesses, uh, which are spread around the world, valued uh, at $1 billion. Now, in the article I wrote about it recently, I suggested that uh, the business should earn $130 million in net profit at some point over the next three or four years. Uh, now, that's uh, actually a really, really low number. It should actually do much better than that. So let's, for the sake of argument, say it can at least do $160 million. Um, again, remember, the reason this isn't a buy is because management just continues to disappoint even our most pessimistic assumptions. So, uh, But let's it should at least be able to do $160 million at some stage over the next few years, if not even next year. Uh, which would put the rest of the business on, a, say, a six times price to earnings ratio. Now, I think it deserves at least 12 times. Um, so if you double that that $1 billion valuation, let's say it's two, so the whole thing's worth $3 billion, then potentially you get a 50% upside and you should get some decent dividends along the way. Uh, but there is a even more bullish case for the business, and that is if it actually does make some good acquisitions or buys back some shares, Pexa goes for over $2 billion because it gets the market excited, for example, um, and some of its investments it's had to make fixing up some of these problems with the recently acquired businesses in the UK. If they start to pay off, then you know maybe this is back to being a, a $6 business, which would still leave it you know, 30 25% short of what its previous highs were. Mm. I mean, the business was going to do almost $0.40 cents in EPS about a year ago was the plan, and that was without any earnings from Pexa. So I think there is a potential um, large upside in this business, but I'm just so disheartened at the way management obfuscates what's going wrong with the business. It's now more sprawling and complicated business than it's ever been before. It's got more debt than it's had before. So just for all these reasons, I don't want to sell it. I just don't think this is the right price to be selling. But um, I mean, it's been plenty of times in the past where you look back and say, look, we should have just got out. But I feel like there's just that much pessimism built into the stock that it wouldn't take too much right. Uh, mm. to go right to get a decent return. And um, the CEO, McMurtry, if I'm McMurtry, uh, was buying shares and uh, I think he bought around a million dollars worth of shares in December at $5 per share. He hasn't opened his wallet since, uh, but I think that $5 mark is uh, more than achievable and probably the price we'd start looking to sell. It reminds me a little bit of um, Fairfax, actually. You know, Fairfax was this kind of, well, it's 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 way worse business than Link, but it was a crappy business that was surrounded by 
um, you know, little brilliant businesses or stakes in brilliant businesses. And Fairfax's strategy was to offload the great businesses and try and resurrect the crappy one. It just it's, always, it's always the way. It's always <laughs> the way. Isn't it? Sorry, you, you go. Yeah, well, you're, you're right, JC. It is seems to be always the way. It, it didn't really work out very well for for Fairfax, and I just, I, I that strategy just in hindsight. Think, go on, go on, JC. Oh, look, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm itching. Yeah, yeah, no, you're it, itching. Go on. It's just the way. It's the, 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 uh, you know, the good. It's the way of highlighting the the value in the good bits. So mm. you know, when when a business is under pressure, it's struggling along, and it's got too much debt. Well, if it's got too much debt, then then you sell off the good bits because that's the way you can raise the most money to pay mm. off the debt. Um, you know, when 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 people just don't don't like a business or a business feels that it's um, undervalued compared to the sum of its parts, mm. then uh, everyone starts talking about the the best bits and and selling those off because that's the way of crystallizing the value. And it, it it's just always the best bits that get sold off. And I wonder whether those are, that's the right the right thing. I mean, in this situation, that may not turn out to be the case because if it's a you know if it's a proper demerger and with domain it was ma- mainly a, a demerger wasn't it yes so, that's right that was um, yeah so people actually you know shareholders actually did get the value of yep. that yep. um and it did crystallize value for people but um, trade so, me oh, so yeah well there you go yeah so, so yeah but uh, well uh i can't I've, I forget how that actually uh, transpired. Did they de- demerge that initially? I think. Oh, um, maybe. Yeah. I, I thought not. Yeah. Maybe, maybe they did. I, but, I don't um, well, they, I think they, it was a combination of both, wasn't it? They, they raised a bit of money out of it as well. So, mm. um, you know, that it's it, it's the tragedy, isn't it, of, of companies that get into trouble, um, is that they end up, um, you know, offloading uh, the, the best bits. As an investor, though, you in that case, and I wonder if in this case. The investor would be better off chasing the better bit, even at, at higher prices, rather than sticking with a cheap stub. Um, and uh, you know, I know Linky's better than Fair. It's not Fairfax. It's better business than that. But you know, I I, I would probably just I'm I'm personally just interested. I'm interested in Pixar. I don't have a lot of interest in Link. Um, management quality is one of them. I I also worry about the contestability of a lot of that revenue as well. I I suspect it's. Um, just more competitive than it appears. Um, yeah, I think uh, you're right there, Gaurav. And there have been a number of contracts that have either been lost recently where a lot of companies are starting to take that IT or their own financial systems in-house. In-house, uh, yeah. because Just because it's a lot easier to do these days than what it used to be. Mm-hmm. And I've also noticed with some of the contracts that have been renewed, they might well be over three to five-year periods, which is great. But Link's not saying anything about the pricing on those contracts and it's also saying that bonuses now have to be earned. So mm-hmm. to me, that suggests they're getting lower prices, mm-hmm. which crunches yeah. the margins, which is always going to be the future headwind for any business that's in financial administration because the cost of doing it is just coming down. So you've got no pricing power. And if you look at this, you know, the next 12 months, financial act- activity is down. Uh, a lot of these superannuants who are um, taking money out of their accounts using the government $20,000 policy, um, that's reducing the number of accounts are closing because of that. So the volume is falling for a lot of those businesses, which means they'll be doing less business and they won't be earning those bonuses. So that's just another reason why I expect the next six months of numbers are going to be awful. Um, and that's, again, that's why I'm not comfortable enough to make it a buy. Well, we've, we've got a name for stocks like PEXA that are um, high free cash flow, um, network effects. We call them um, uh, Carlisle stocks um, because <laughs> JC has often been the champion of those businesses at seemingly crazy prices. Um, JC, what do you think about Pexa? Is this one that that does this is this a Carlisle stock? It, it, it could be that. That's why I was um, uh, that's why I was looking at it a couple of years ago. But um, the uh, I, I, I like I said, I just had trouble with the valuation. Cause, I mean, you know, to make sense of a, Jeez, I if mean, James look, is worried about valuation, we ought to be. Well, no, well it's it's. <laughs> The the point is that it's not, uh, you know, there's a there's a limit to the market size. Yeah, no, it no, seems I, I think you're right. I mean, yeah. when everything shifts mm. online, digital. Mm. I mean, I forget the the precise details of it, but when everything has become digital in this market, that's mm. a limit. I mean, property sales are only growing at so many, you know, a few percent a year. So there's a limit to to the growth you can get out of that. Um, now that doesn't mean to say that it's not an attractive business because you know it's high, it, highly cash generative. It's a very strong market position um, for the right price. That's a great business. Mm-hmm. Um, but to pay a high price, you've got to get some growth. And and um, and I think that there, there's opportunities for using the platform that 
this gives uh, PEXA to, you know, generate revenues in other areas. And I think that's possibly the interesting part. Um, but I, uh, I just not, I'm quite sure what those are. They haven't really, I don't think they've really been very clear about it themselves. And mm. I think um, may, maybe when the uh, IPO prospectus comes along, they'll be a bit clearer about that. Um, because that's that's probably what you need to get the the extra bit on the valuation. The secret source for our real estate.com.au has been its ability to put up prices over time because mm. the agents themselves are willing to compete, um, you know, to pay for premium pricing to make sure that um, their stock of homes gets top billing. You don't have that on the PEXA um, yeah. business. Like no one's competing yeah. Yeah. to for advertising um, place on the page or anything like that. It's just a standard fee. So there might well be good pricing power in the business, but it's not going to be anything like um, what you have at rea.com. So I think that point that James made earlier about um, the market being somewhat fixed um, in a way that maybe REA's uh, market isn't uh, is really important. Make It sounds as though it might make more sense for a super fund or, or some private owner to own this rather than being listed really but anyway we'll, i guess we'll see Jay, um Nath, i think you become the default analyst on link now is that what is that what's happened uh it is uh, i mean <laughs> i had it in the funds um mm. a fair while ago as well and uh, i think sometimes you you know like we're 10 11 years into a bull market and it was just hard to find anything that was remotely interesting and i think that's what's uh, the real big difference between now and the gfc and you know we're talking about everyone's talking about whether we get a v recovery in markets and the economy and whatnot but when we're coming out of the GFC, like asset prices were just so cheap. You know, some, you know, flight center like went up tenfold in like six months or something coming out of the GFC. Whereas now we're actually, I haven't seen the numbers lately, but my guess would be for US stocks, we're probably still in the 90th percentile for historic valuations, uh, which is well, really- I think that. The thing is, people are talking about V's and Nike swooshes and U's, but they, but they all they all they all go up at the end, don't they? And the GFC people were just talking about down, I think, and that, that's probably the difference. So everyone is is looking through this. I mean, it's all very painful, and for some companies, it's probably terminal. But um, but you know, people are looking through to the upside, whereas that was uh, that seemed for a little while in the GFC that seemed a long way away. You know, we're out of it when we start hearing the term green shoots. Then you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, anything else to add, Nate? Uh, no, I don't think so. Nice one, JC. Um, anything you want to chat about? No, not not for me. All right, let's do it then. Okay, um, gents, thanks very much for joining me today. Nathan, thank you for your time. Thanks, Gaurav. Cheers, James. JC, pleasure as always. Cheers. Cheers, guys. All right, everyone else, thank you for listening.